Um, um, from there, I actually decided since I only moved four miles away from my parents' house, so I decided I need to get, you know, a little more than that uh, for graduate school. And I decided to go to USA across the country um, in 2011. Uh, there I worked for Neil Garg, and I'll talk about that in the next slide as well, some of my research. And I actually uh, uh, graduated in 2016. Um, and I just decided instead of going back to New Jersey, I said, let's, let's find some middle ground here and decided to go to, uh, to do some agrochemistry work in the middle of the country um, in Indianapolis, where I live, I'm located now for Dow Agro. Um, as you might be a little confused, uh, as I mentioned, I worked for Corteva AgroSciences. So in, after I moved here in 2016 and 2019, we actually went through a merger and acquisition and, and a spin uh, with, Dow, with DuPont and Dow merging. And we ended up uh, spinning a new company called Corteva. And so I'll tell you a little bit about my research uh, travels as well here. And so not all research experiences are the same. And I think I mentioned this earlier. I said that I originally was going to med school um, and I had my first research experience uh, with Professor Jane Hinch uh, working on helium beam scattering physical chemistry. And I was a freshman and sophomore working on this, analyzing data and I didn't love it. I'll be, I'll be fair. Um, it wasn't really, didn't really incite me, didn't really, um, you know, intrigue me very much, but it paid the bills for my undergraduate research. Um, and so it was a nice, a nice little benefit there. And I got to interact with some really, really cool scientists and work on some really interesting um, engineering problems uh, for with helium beam scattering. I decided to let's take another stab at research and I decided to move upstairs to the organic chemistry floor uh, and start working for Dan Seidel, uh, working on a kinetic resolution of, of amines. And this is really, really, really got me intrigued about working on organic chemistry. And so at this point, actually, I was my junior year and it was June 7, June 11th, sorry. And I remember this day very well because it was the day I got my first uh, JAX publication as an undergrad. and that was the day I realized that I do not want to go to med school anymore. Um, and I realized that because it was just a really, really, um, you know, life-changing experience of actually getting, getting your, you know, getting your research published. And I realized that I really enjoy, you know, getting my hands dirty and, and making compounds and trying to, you know, troubleshoot reaction, things like that. And so that was my kind of pivotal moment. I've changed my, changed my trajectory in my life. And so, as I mentioned, I left Rutgers, um, and went off to UCLA to work for Professor uh, Neil Garg. Uh, um, there, I went from methodology development in, in Rutgers to actually doing total synthesis. And so I tackled this molecule, telocytin A and telocytin A, A1 and A2. And these were uh, some, had some, some biological activity here. And so I worked on that project for about two and a half years. Um, and for anyone who has ever read natural product papers or done natural product synthesis, they are very long and very tedious. And so I needed a little bit of a break from that natural product synthesis um, and started doing new reaction development, working on benzene chemistry and some nickel catalysis. On the side, I actually had the opportunity to work on um, this online platform that I, I coined Bacon. Uh, and so we, myself and Professor Neil Gard, uh, developed these online tutorials uh, that really connected the organic chemistry that we teach in sophomore level classes to biology and biochemistry, and also to real life and pop culture. And so for example, you can think about an SN2 reaction, uh, you know, in your organic textbook, actually is prevalent in biological, uh, biological scenarios too, and actually in amino acid synthesis here. And so, you know, we would try to connect these dots here for those, those uh, pharmaceutical or pre-med majors who didn't realize there is a humongous connection between biology and biochemistry and, and organic chemistry. And for, of course, a little bit of fun here, we try to connect it to um, some, some real life examples too, and some historical examples like chemical warfare and Joker's Venom from Batman. Um, and so after, after five years in LA and then the nice palm trees and sunshines, I decided I need some winter. Uh, and I decided to move to Indiana uh, to work for Dow Agro. And so the, some of these are some of the molecules that, that, that are agro related. Um, this is uh, Aralex uh, and, and, uh, and a couple from BM, uh, BSF. Uh, it's a fun side here. And so, um, you know, this is my research background and I, I, I tell this slide, not all research uh, provides the same experience. Um, I think if I didn't have that organic chemistry experience uh, that I had in my undergraduate time, I probably would not be where I am today. 
And so I really implore everyone here to, you know, experience different researches. Not all research is the same. If you don't, really, if you don't like biochemistry, maybe try organic chemistry, try physics, you know, or try computer science. I uh, really, I think undergraduate research is really important and it really, uh, you know, changes the way you perceive science, I think, from reading a paper um, to getting actually your hands dirty and actually getting into the lab. So uh, after my little soapbox there, I'll get into uh, agrochemistry here. And so, uh, as I mentioned, I work in, in an agrochemical company. And so why do I do what I do? Um, and I want to tell you a couple of reasons why uh, our, our, live, our work is important, our research is very important. And one of those reasons is, you know, uh, environmental stress, um, global warming, and the need for more food. And so this, this graphic here shows that uh, in 1950, um, one hectare, which is basically about a baseball field, um, fed about two people. Uh, but by 2030, we need that one hectare to feed five, uh, five people. And so that's double uh, the output we need from our, from our um, arable land. And as you, as you all are aware, probably aware, uh, environmental stresses like global warming and water shortages uh, um, are causing this even uh, have a higher impact. And that arable, arable land or farmable land is actually is decreasing as, as we speak. The other, other um, thing to mention here is the population of the U.S. Or the world is increasing, um, as you see here, going from 2.5 to 7 billion to 9 billion in 2050. And this is mostly uh, growth in the emerging, emerging areas in the world. Um, and because of the emerging area growth, uh, there actually is a demand, a higher demand in, in um, the, the grains that, that uh, we need to feed our, feed our populations. And so but to put in a nutshell, we have climate change, we have less arable land, we have water scarcity, and we already have uh, millions of people that are undernourished. And so really our goal, is that, goal as, as an agrochemist is to develop technology to help farmers uh, sustainably increase the production of healthy food and minimize environmental impact. And so that's what that really means is, can, can we get more out of our land um, in a safe and environmentally friendly way? And so some of those things, some, some of the products that we uh, work on, or areas we work on are controlling weeds, managing disease or controlling crop damage, particularly by insects or nematodes or things that are the ground. And so, you know, for Teva, we've developed a number of products. This, these are our small molecule products that we develop in-house. Um, that some of them have won green chemistry awards, meaning that they are presidentially stamped for uh, either being environmentally friendly or breaking down the soil or very low use rates, things like that. But these are some of the examples that, that uh, are compounds that we would, we would try to develop in-house and cover that through a process. I'll explain in a few more slides. And so some of you who have might have seen the previous, uh, the day in the life of medicinal chemistry uh, from pharma or the day in the life of a process chemistry, um, these might look very similar. And I, and I hope I can convey to you today that um, as an agrochemist or medicinal chemistry for plant, uh, medicinal chemistry for plants, we work on very similar structures and we work on very similar um, area of uh, work processes. And so with that, I'm going to tell you a little bit of how we get to where we get to. Uh, and, you know, so I'll start here on this side here, where we start on the agrochemical side, we have a hit generation area where we, where we find new compounds or new hits. And I'll explain on the next slide how we find those hits. But once you find that hit, we're exploring, we're changing, changing atoms, carbons, nitrogens, adding uh, different carbons, nitrogen, sulfurs, oxygens, and see if we can get a better potent compound. And that will move to the lead generation area. You know, we're making 100,000 compounds, 200,000 compounds here as a whole, and hopefully we're finding a new, a new more potent compound. And that again moves on to lead optimization, followed by the phasing um, and development, and then followed, lastly, registration and launch. Um, I, I've outlined here that this is about 11 year time frame from going from a hit to all the way to product. So that's a, it's a very long time to, to discover and launch a new product. Um, but we're working, you know, as a discovery chemist, I'm working in the early stages here um, in the hit generation, lead generation, and lead optimization area. And we start working with process chemistry later in the, later in the phased candidates area. And finally, you're working with manufacturing and process development um, in, in the development and the registration and launch. So, for those of you who have seen the process, process chemistry or the medicinal chemistry talks previously in this, in this uh, series, this looks very similar to a pharmaceutical development uh, timeline where they start with a pre-discovery, drug discovery, preclinical, which is very similar to our phase candidates, clinical trials, you can think of it as the development, 
we're doing a lot of testing on different fields and different uh, insects and plants, and, and obviously, lastly, launching. And so um, some of the key differences I just want to highlight here is that the development cost of an agrochemical is, is actually tenfold less than a pharmaceutical, and that's mostly due to the clinical trial cost and the human trials that are required in the, in the pharmaceutical world. Um, but we have a very high percentage of uh, approved uh, um, agrochemicals, and that's really due to the ability to test on the target organism. And I'll talk about that a little later. We're able to test on the plants that we will see in the field. We're able to test on the insects and then the fungi that actually are, um, are, 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 are pests that we want to control. Uh, versus, you know, in pharma, you usually do a lot of enzymatic tests, Followed by, um, followed by the clinical trials where you actually get to, get to test your compound in, in, um, in human, um, um, uh, humans actually to see if it solves their uh, potential disease or uh, um, a treatment for the disease. And so uh, it's about $2.6 mil billion dollars in, in cost for a new pharmaceutical, um, but only, and only 12% of those actually, uh, of new can candidates actually get approved uh, by the FDA. Now that's the other thing to just to mention here, you know, pharmaceuticals go through the FDA process, we go through the EPA process in the US, and then there's equivalent, uh, equivalent body in all the other countries like Brazil and Europe uh, and so on. And so, as I mentioned, uh, we have this hit generation area. We, ha we have to find these hits from somewhere. Um, and so some of those areas, I'll detail here right down this slide. Um, and so we, we actually look at natural products as an inspiration. Um, this is a tried and true method for a lot of pharmaceuticals also, um, where we take natural products and test them in our assays and seeing if we can get any kind of biological response um, and control of weeds, fungi, and insects. We'll do, we'll do modifications once we find that hit. And so this is just one example here. Uh, Spinetoram is actually a modification of a spinosin product. Um, and so we reduced an olefin um, in the in yellow here, and we actually have capped and uh, um, um, therified this alcohol here uh, to make this active product here. And those are small modifications we do after we ferment the natural product on scale in metric ton amounts. Another area we, we, uh, we try to find hits is competitor inspired. And so uh, many companies will take uh, other companies' products or uh, related materials and try to modify them to, to exploit um, for spectrum or potency or other variants. And this is just two examples. One is Renaxapir here, where there's, an, there's a, a bromide here. Uh, they've modified this molecule and added this tetrazole, uh, methylene tetrazole compound to get a better spectrum and better potency. The last two areas I'll mention here are innovation through external, external chemistry and innovation through de novo chemistry. And so the example of ex, uh, ex existing internal chemistry is taking a, a molecule from our own company and improving it um, by various, uh, various SAR or various uh, modifications to get enhancements in spectrum, metabolic resistance, or residual uh, qualities. Um, the last area here is de novo chemistry where we try to use novel structures from our database or inspiration from pharma, uh, where we do in silico screening using computers to see if we can actually find new hits and new actives. And so these are four ways where we try to find small hints of biological activity. And from there, we actually start doing something called SAR, where we start modifying these molecules and adding in different atoms and different functional groups to see if we can get a better potency or better response, biological response uh, from these compounds. And so how do we do this? Uh, we really go through this hypothesis testing cycle of this chemistry. So we have a new hypothesis, we have a hit, we want to modify it. So we have a hypothesis of how do we modify it? What is the limiting factor of limiting the, the potency? Once we, we think of a new hypothesis, we'll undergo, as a chemist, we'll synthesize these molecules and we'll order them for testing. And I'll explain some of the testing cascades we have um, in, in the agro industry. We get some biological data back and we use that in our in, in, in data analysis here and we go make a new hypothesis. So this is an iterative cycle of, of um, make of hypothesis, make compound, test a compound, analyze uh, that data. As an organic chemist, I'll go in a little more detail of how we actually uh, um, um, make a compound. And so once we have a hypothesis in mind, we are trying to go through retrosynthesis uh, and kind of condition selection here. 
And so we have a route in mind, and we for food through retrosynthesis, we find those reagents in our lab, we order them, whatever we need to do. Uh, we set up those reactions, we analyze those reactions, and we purify them uh, using our preparative chromatography or various other ways. And hopefully that compound comes out pure uh, and we can register it. But a lot of times when you're, when you're working in, our, in, in research, um, we're really working in novel chemical space where it's not, it's not known into the, the, um, to uh, any literature or any kind of a database. And so we're, we're, sometimes we do fail. And a lot of times in medicinal chemistry, you will try to make a compound, it didn't work. So you gotta go back to the drawing board and try again then to make that compound a different way. And so you plan another synthetic route, find new reagents, and go do, uh, and do the cycle over again. And hopefully you will uh, uh, get to that compound you desire to, to, um, to um, get the data to see if your hypothesis was correct or not. And so um, if, well, how do we, what are some of the ways we do this? What are some of the tools we use uh, to, or, the, or the people we interact with to do this? And so some of the capabilities we have uh, as a synthetic chemist and agrochemist, I'll start with the top box here is we have NMR. And so we, when we make a compound or, or make something that we don't know what it is, we use NMR to, to uh, differentiate or try to figure out or structurally elucidate the compound. Um, we do a lot of parallel synthesis, it's called. And so we're, we're making you know, tens of thousands of compounds for this, uh, this new product to explore it. We need a way to run compounds in, or run reactions in parallel. And so we do a lot of parallel synthesis where you're setting up 10, 20, 100 reactions simultaneously and, and then purifying them in a, in a, in a parallel manner. Uh, to purify, we have these things called ISCOs, uh, where actually it's, it's a semi-automated way to uh, purify uh, organic compounds. Um, and the last here is something called computer, uh, we call it KMD, but it's basically computer, uh, um, computer design or, or molecular design. And so we have computational chemists who are, who are in our teams that will engage with us and will help us design new compounds or new hypotheses or try to explain some of the data we actually have acquired. And so we're not just working on this alone. As chemists, we work with biologists, we work with uh, a various number of entomologists and people who are support staff. And so in this box here, you can see it tracks per application. Um, we have biologists looking at our, our greenhouse uh, plants and seeing how what the effect of our compounds are. We use automation, our, our herbicide sprayer here, where we actually spray our compounds on top of a plate of, uh, plate of uh, plants. Um, since we do test on our organisms, we do have an insectary on site where we actually grow, in, we actually, uh, grow insects and, and, and um, from, from their, hatch them from eggs and so on. So we actually have a um, FDA or USDA regulated site where we actually grow, in, grow insects and also grow fungi that are not native to the US. Um, because we are a global company and we have to tackle diseases across the world. Um, and I'll just, you know, last thing here is this uh, our propagation facility here. Since we are testing again on the organism, uh, we need, we still need to grow all these plants. Um, you know, for our herbicide, uh, for our, our weed management assays, we have over 30 to 40 different uh, weed species. And so trying to grow, you know, 20 different species and then times that by the number of compounds you're trying to test, that's a lot of plants to grow. And so we have vertical farms on our site, and you can see a picture here of this uh, vertical um, in a vertical propagation facility we have. Also, our bugs need food, and so we actually grow uh, food on site too for our bugs to eat as well. And so all of this is happening alongside um, our synthesis to make sure we can test our compounds in, a, in an efficient manner. And so to go a little more detail of the chemistry aspect of this, as synthetic chemist, we use uh, various tools. Uh, we're, we're not just putting things in vials and then heating them up. We use things called microwaves actually. So you actually can nuke your reaction to make it go faster. To, uh, and, and sometimes a, a, a radiation can actually affect the way their, their transformation works. And so we use uh, various microwaves. We use photochemistry to uh, help us um, access different SCR, electrochemistry. And we also use um, something called high throughput experimentation where we, we want to screen conditions we actually can set up an experiment here and try 96 different conditions, chemical reactions, to see which one will give us the product that we desire. We use a variety of different softwares, data analysis. Um, from one compound, you can get over 100 different data points um, in, in, one, in, in, a, in an assay, basically. And so we need a, a way to visualize all of these, all these data points. And that's where a program called Spotfire and Data Warrior um, which I'm a big fan of both of them. I'm a big data person. So I, I love looking at data and visualizations and trying to figure out the nuances and everything like that. And so 
we do a lot of that work and we do a lot of patent work too. We actually look at a lot of patents and we uh, skim through a lot of patents and figure out what our competitors are working on. Um, how do we file patents ourselves? Obviously, of course, as industry, um, like most organic chemists, we actually, you know, we have our chemistry analytical purification lab. So we interact with our purification lab. They will purify some of the more difficult compounds for us. Um, it's try to separate different enantiomers or diastereomers you might have learned about in organic in their sophomore organic classes. Um, we have a whole spec team. And so those people who don't like spectroscopy, uh, we actually can sometimes, we basically can give our compound to our spec team and they can figure out what it is. If, if you don't want to look at a 2D NMR or a proton NMR and like, I don't know what this is, I can't figure it out. You guys figure it out. And so, you know, our goal is to, is to figure out the synthesis um, and we have dedicated personnel to, to uh, we interact with, we work with on a daily basis uh, to help us do our jobs. Uh, the last two groups here, I'll just mention here, uh, the computational and molecular design teams, they're looking at, they're basically computational chemists. They're doing docking studies. They're doing QSAR models, ligand protein docking, reverse docking. And so this is basically how the compound interacts with the enzyme and seeing if, if, um, if how, how those things, uh, uh, are they potent? Are they large? Is there a good binding between the the, uh, the molecule and the ligand? And the last thing here is the microscopy. Since we're working on plants, we actually can um, do a, a, um, a image of the plant and seeing where the fungal pathogens are on the plant and seeing if our compound controls it by using different dyes and using a, um, a green fluorescent protein uh, um, expression on these on these on these plants. And so that's kind of a cool way to see. Hey, it's not just like spraying a plant and hoping for the best. You actually can see the infection um, and seeing how the compound is affecting the, the plant. Um, and so these are some of, I'll, I'll quickly go through this. As I mentioned earlier, there's three different areas, the insecticides, fungicides, herbicides. Um, there's different types of insecticide. There's sap feeding, which are underneath the plant. There's chewing, which are yeah, basically chewing the plant. So there's different types of compounds that affect both of those. Fun, uh, for fungi, there's actually two different types, two big types. There's the uh, Ascomyces and Placidomyces. That's basically a rust or, and that's a leaf blotch. Um, there's also a curative and there's a protectant type of fungicide. Um, so you might find in a store, uh, in a grocery store, usually those ones that are for humans are, are curative, um, but we also have protectant fungicide, fungicide uh, applications also, where if a farmer knows that there's gonna be a fungal uh, um, outbreak in their field this year, they can, can spray a compound in their field uh, to, to protect against any other any spores that come, come from their neighbor's farms or things like that. So you can think of that, think of that as a vaccine versus antibiotic. And so that's the kind of the equivalent there. Um, and then lastly, here's herbicides here, which is pre and post, which basically means has the plant actually broke the surface of the soil. And so if that's pre, if the plant has already broke the surface of the soil, that's a post application that has different properties you need to affect those things. And of course, there's obviously most people in this call know there's different types of grasses. There's a there's there's a long grass and there's like basically a broadly um, um, grass species. So we do a number of different types of tests. Level one, which are small plants. Level twos are higher volume but more species. Um, and so in level one, you would imagine one or two plants in a 96 well kind of plate, like you would think about biology. Um, but in level two, you'd have maybe more species and in different rate structure also. So you would have different concentrations you would have. Um, and then level three and four, we get more complicated, we get more species, more concentrations, and hopefully get a dose response. And in all these cases, you would get a numerical value from zero to hundred of the, of the control. And so for example, if you want, if you have a compound that controls a, a grass uh, really well, you want it to be uh, at a hundred, um, but you also don't want, to, don't want to damage the corn or the soy or the, or the, or the strawberries. Um, and so that's why you want that to be, so that's why we want that to be zero. And so we want to make sure we're controlling the weeds and not the crops in this case. Um, so I'll quickly go through kind of like the challenges associated with, once you have a compound in hand, there's a lot of different variables that go into uh, making a really good, or uh, finding a new product. And so um, if you're familiar with the, the medicinal chemistry and pharmaceutical world, um, there's the ADME it's called. So it's absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. In our case, it's absorption, distribution, metabolism, and degradation. And so degradation meaning that does it fall apart after a certain amount of time? So we don't want compounds lingering around in the soil or in the plant after it's, it's done its job. Um, but you can't really, so with a pharmaceutical, you can, you can tell someone to take a, pharm take a drug, a pill, an IV. You can't really tell, tell a plant to take an IV or a, a pill. 
And so there's a lot of different variables here. So you, you would take a formulation or a liquid, um, a liquid solution or a granular solution and spray it on top of the plant um, and hope that the compound does penetrate the leaf um, and go to the, the, the appropriate place for control of the weed or the insect that you desire. But on this slide here, it's, I've, showed, uh, I've mentioned a few different uh, potential pathways of, 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 um, of negative pathways. And so you can imagine the plant metabolism, the plant chews it up and the compound is not active anymore. That's not good. Um, the water solubility is huge. If the water, if the water washes the compound off, it just goes, goes away. It doesn't actually go to the area you want it to go. Um, is there a root uptake? Is there, is there issue of that? Is there soil metabolism? Is there water leaching? Um, you can imagine if there's a compound actually move around in the plant. So that's called phloem. Is it phloem mobile? Um, and volatility is another one. Does the compound just evaporate when it's sunny outside? Um, or does it, is it UV stable? If the sun breaks down the compound, if it's sitting on the leaf, the sun is really, uh, really uh, has very harsh rays, does the compound just break down? And also lastly, the, the uh, obviously rain, if it rains right after the application, does it just wash off? And so all these are, these are different factors that we have to account for when we're developing a new product. Um, and so each one of the therapeutic areas, insecticides, fungicides, and herbicides, all have a slightly different properties, physical properties. So is it, so the water solubility and, and the liquid felicity or the greasiness of the compound to affect, um, to, to make a good product. And so um, I think Ashley mentioned this in the intro, you know, we have these challenges that are, that are, that are we can tackle through research and science. Um, by testing, um, but it's also environmental challenges where resistance is huge across the globe. And so since 1984, 10 to 15 new species have appeared, resistant species have appeared every year. And so just like there's resistance to antibiotics these days, we have resistance across the board uh, to a variety of different herbicides and insecticides and even fungicides here. And so this slide just shows that, you know, we need new mode of actions, we need new ways to control these um, pathogens because Nature is really good about um, to, uh, overcoming some, you know, uh, evolution is really good about overcoming some of these um, uh, resistance, resistances. And so once you have an active, if you can solve all of these challenges <laughs> and you have an active or a lead, the next step uh, is, is going to lead optimization. And so in lead optimization, uh, which is where I am, actually, is you start optimizing the molecule even further for safety, efficacy, and selectivity. And this means developing new formulations so that, that the, the plant uh, can uptake uh, the, the compound better. You wanna make sure that there's environmental testing going on here. So you wanna make sure that the compound is not affecting the environment um, and the soil, make sure it breaks down the soil. Um, and you're also doing a lot of, you're working with process chemistry to, to see if you can make this compound um, an appropriate, um, appropriate cost, because cost is always huge for farmers. And we don't wanna make, sure, make sure that farmers can actually afford these things. And so, uh, as I as I uh, uh, as I alluded to earlier, that we work with a lot of different people. Uh, so we're working with other synthetic chemists, computational chemists, formulation chemists, environmental chemists, biologists, toxicologists, and really the goal is to translate from the greenhouse to the field. And so, as I mentioned, you know, we've been doing a lot of greenhouse testing in the early stages. Can we actually translate this perfect condition of the greenhouse to actually a field? So in, in the in the area where the where the pest is present, and so if you're working on a a wheat uh, a wheat um, herbicide, so you're trying to control the the uh, pests around wheat, you would go to Europe, you'd go to um, you know UK or Hungary or Germany, and that's where most of the wheat is grown in the world. And so that's where you would you would actually take your compound and take us in a small plot of land. You would actually spray your compound in in that field, and this is where you actually get to see real life. Is there weather effects? Is there UV effects? Is there genetic variations? Not all wheat is the same. Um, and so there is hundreds and hundreds of different types of wheat um, in Europe and around the world. And so every farmer has a different seed they wanna use. Um, and so that might be a different variation, which means different metabolism in the plant and things like that. And so we have to make sure that our compound is universally good, not just on a certain particular type of seed. And of course, we wanna formulate the water. Uh, in Indiana, we have very hard water, um, and so that is very different than Europe water versus my, even New Jersey. I, you know, there's different types of uh, minerals in the water, and so making sure our formulation that we give to our uh, farmers gets diluted with water and actually works still. Because you can imagine hard water and other effects can actually affect the formulation or the final product and how it actually applies to the plant. 
And if in herbicide case, we're gonna make sure the crops are mixed with the pests and see and making sure that we control the, we actually uh, keep the crops as healthy as possible, only control the pests that we are, or we desire. And so I mentioned process chemistry here. Uh, I'll just do a little bit of compare and contrast here of the uh, pharmaceutical, they're working on kilo scale. Uh, they usually have like one manufacturing site or two manufacturing sites in the world. Um, and they have a higher cost of manufacturing limit. I'll, I'll talk about that in my next slide a little bit here. Uh, but in our, our agrochemicals, uh, we actually work on metric ton scale. Uh, so it's huge, huge amount, thousands of, of, of tons of, of, um, of final AI. And we actually are global manufacturing because you, want, you don't want to ship a metric ton of material to Brazil if you manufacture in the US because that's going to cost you a ton of money. So we have actually manufacturing sites around the world and we try to manufacture uh, where the product will be used. And so you want to, it's also easy to, instead of, instead of uh, packaging it in the US and then shipping it out, you, just, you can package it in the country with the right labels and the right materials in the country of, that you're trying to sell it in. As I mentioned, we are a global company. And so we have products in Brazil, in Africa, in all over Europe, um, all over the US, Asia, um, and, and um, Australia also. And so the last thing I'll mention here is very, very low cost. And what do we mean by very low cost? And so if any of you have been to a pharmacy and, and got a, got a um, you know, any kind of uh, generic or even, you might say even non-generic drugs, you might be paying a couple of dollars a bottle or so, maybe ten, twenty dollars after insurance. There's no insurance really in in the in when you're trying to acquire uh, uh, agrochemicals uh, to save your field. And so farmers have to pay thousands of dollars a year to protect their fields because that's the livelihood. And so uh, in a little little arithmetic here: field use times COM. COM COM means cost of manufacturing equals dollar per hectare. And so really, really what the farmer wants to know is: can I can I spray this in my field? Because when they sell their crop, it's going to be dollar per hectare. So uh, of, of corn, for example. And so um, for us, it's not just about the use rate. So instead of, in the case of pharmaceuticals, milligrams per pill, uh, this will be this will be grams per hectare uh, with, the, with the use rate. And a, and a hectare is basically a professional baseball field or roughly a rugby field for those of you not in the U.S. And so this, since the farmers have a budget, they take the cost. Made, you know, they think about dollars per hectare. So for, for scientists, we have to actually take the use rate and multiply it by the cost of manufacturing. And so if you do a little math here, you basically, if the, if the farmer is only going to pay $5 a hectare, you have to, you have to basically be in that $5 in this blue area right here. So your use rate has to be, if your use rate is $30, you have to be below $200 a kilo. And so for those of you who have, have seen Sigma Aldridge or any other vendor, chemical vendor, it's pretty hard to buy something that's Two hundred dollars, less than two hundred dollars a kilo on Sigma Aldridge. So our process chemists are pretty, pretty good about you know making low cost products. And so I'll finish off with this slide here. Uh, small molecules really have a global implication. Um, you know these are just two of our products here: Aralex on the on the left, Rinsequil on the right. Here, these are two of our herbicides, and you can see here untreated wheat uh, with poppies coming out of it. Uh, that pop poppies are good in certain cases. In this case, in wheat fields, they're not good, and farmers do not like the poppy. And as you can see here, this is a treated plot of land here with Aralex looking beautifully uh, without poppies popping up. And this case here is a rice field, um, I believe, in Japan. Um, you see untreated rice here. It doesn't looks kind of you know kind of jungly here, um, but with with, with uh, treated rinse core here, uh, you can see it's a pretty clean. You can see the individual plants in the bottom here, and that's what you want to see because if, with the, with the other uh, pests or other plants around the nutrients from the water and 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 and, um, and, and other uh, benefits will be diminished and your yield will be diminished in the long run. And so, um, just want to say, medicinal chemistry plants. You take your. Uh, I never thought I would take my organic chemistry background and be solving um, uh, um, uh, global food. Uh, 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 issues and resistance, um, but that's really what, what I do. And, and I think take, just because you're an organic chemist, you can do a lot of different things. Um, as, as I think you probably have seen in different talks here, um, you can solve medicinal chemistry problems. You can solve cosmetic problems. Um, you also can solve global uh, food and hunger. And, and um, these are some of those things that 
uh, we solve here, like in tomatoes, we, we actually have a product that solves um, early blight. For those of you who love strawberries, that gray mold, uh, we do have products that will solve the gray mold. And we have products for cucumber, wheat, rice, and uh, sugar beets. And something I, you know, my first two, my first two years here, I had a, I had a, a, a product or a, I had a, a, a compound that went to the UK and it was kind of the cool experience. You made, you made something in a lab and nine months later, it's being scaled up in a lab next door and then getting shipped to Europe to be tested in a field um, to see if it works. And that's one of the, probably one of my uh, highlights of my career here uh, at Corteva. Um, but I, and I hope I get a product someday uh, in, in my near, in the near future. And so with that, I will um, answer any questions you guys have, and I'm, I'm happy to uh, have any questions about my career or, or agrochemistry in general. Thank you. Thanks, Tegas. That was great. I actually learned a lot. Um, yeah, about organic chemistry and how we can actually we can use it to test for plants on plants and help feed the world. Um, does anyone have any questions for him? You can unmute yourself or ask it in the chat. All right, we do. We did have a few questions come in before um, the meeting, and so. One question was, what opportunities are there for non-organic chemists in the agricultural sciences? And then second part of that question is, why did you choose to work at Cortiva? So the first question, um, there is tons of opportunities. Uh, I think I mentioned earlier, we, we interact with a lot of different chemists. Um, we interact with analytical chemists, we interact with toxicologists or uh, interact with um, uh, biochemists the molecular biologist, computational chemist. And so all of them have different, slightly different role, uh, but we all, there's all these interplays. Um, computational chemists, for example, can work in designing new compounds, um, but they also can work in trying to figure out the metabolism and why, the, why um, there's a tox issue with a certain compound. They can also work on um, trying to figure out a new mechanism to make a make a compound on, on scale and process chemistry. So that's just one example of, of a computational chemist working across different fields. Um, analytical chemistry, for example, can work in a lot of different fields, um, in a lot of different areas. They can work in discovery chemistry by purifying different compounds, separating different compounds. They can work in regulatory by finding metabolites. Um, they can work in process chemistry, trying to uh, scale up and find um, byproducts in the reaction mixtures. And so I think, as a chemist, you can work in any one, any number of departments, regardless if you're organic chemist, inorganic chemist, analytical, and so on. 